Let me turn these lights on. You know, you start getting old. You need as much light as you can on the material. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's spectacular to see all of you here this morning. You folks up there, you doing all right? Good, good. We like it. That's a full house. I always know how many people are here by looking up there. It's a full house up there. It's a full house here. This is terrific. Um, it is, first, thanks to the Color Guard and to Angela Beth Perdue. It is a privilege to serve again as your Master of Ceremony for the 2024 United States Astronaut Hall of Fame induction. We're here to honor two distinguished space explorers who each have outstanding careers and have made incredibly significant contributions to NASA and the world. Combined roles, they've spent more than 75 days in space, serving in different positions throughout their illustrious careers. Today, we induct two astronaut heroes into the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame, David Hilmers and Marsha Ivins. <laughs> Together, they comprise the 25th class of astronauts to be inducted into the Hall of Fame, bringing the total number of astronauts in this prestigious society to 109. Before we move on, I would like to recognize the many distinguished guests who have joined us today. As I say your name, please stand up and wave to the audience. NASA Administrator Bill Nelson. I think Bill's in the, in the back. <laughs> Kennedy Space Center's Director, Center Engagement and Business Integration Services, Kim Carter. Kim? Johnson Space Center's Associate Director for Vision and Strategy, Dr. Douglas Terrier. <laughs> Among our distinguished guests are, of course, as you would expect, a number of astronauts. Please welcome Ellen Baker, <laughs> Andrew Allen, Wendy Lawrence, Jim J.R. Riley, Kay Heyer, okay. Rick Mastracchio, Mike Paisan, <laughs> Joan Higginbotham, <laughs> Shane Kimbrell, and Nicole Stott. Nicole. Also here to celebrate the outstanding accomplishments of our inductees are a few of their predecessors, other fearless explorers who have deepened our understanding of space through their brave endeavors and have since taken their place in the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame. I would like to recognize them now. They will pause for a moment in front of the stage before taking their seats. He piloted STS-1 Columbia, the very first space shuttle mission. He went on to command three more missions and later served as director of NASA's Kennedy Space Center, Robert Griffith. He was selected by NASA in 1978 as part of the first group of space shuttle astronauts and a veteran of five space flights. Logged more than 140 days in space, going back. Logging more than 500 hours in space on three missions. This pilot and commander also led the Space Shuttle Orbiter return to flight team following the Challenger tragedy. Rooster Shaw. He piloted the first shuttle flight to land on Kennedy Space Center's runway, then went on to command four more flights, including the first shuttle mission to dock with the Russian space station gear, Robert Hood Gibson. A veteran of three space flights, he logged a total of 411 hours in space, including 10 hours of EVA flight time, and served as the astronaut office representative in the Space Shuttle Extravehicular Mobility Unit Development Effort. George 
Pinky Nelson, an accomplished fighter pilot who dedicated 25 years to military service. He orbited Earth 319 times as a mission specialist on STS 51C, 61A, 29, and 48, flying with a still classified military payload, conducting science and research, and deploying NASA satellites. Jim Buckley, Jim. She's a veteran of three space shuttle missions, including two space lab flights. This medical doctor ultimately logged more than 722 hours in space during her astronaut career. Dr. Ray said. She's a veteran of five. Say a few words on behalf of the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex, is Chief Operating Officer and my good friend, Theron Protzi. John, oh, by the way, John, uh, in April we had an event and John called me out that uh, I did not renew his annual pass. <laughs> so, in order to reconcile that issue, John, here's your annual pass. <laughs> I do want to point out we, uh, we use his driver's license photo, so. <laughs> it was supposed to be a lifetime pass. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll talk later. <laughs> Do some in-kind speaking for us, John. <laughs> Have a little fun there. Uh, true American heroes, no doubt. Uh, welcome and thanks, everyone, for joining us here at Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. It is our honor to host today's ceremony to welcome NASA's astronauts David Hilmers and Mar Marsha Ivins into the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame. It is an exciting time here as we continue to tell the NASA story with sensational new additions like a brand new entry experience for our guests a 3,000 square foot video display that tells the story of NASA past, present, and the exciting future. With attention grabbing technology that makes the images appear as they leap, leap off the screen, especially when the astronaut comes away from the ISS, it's amazing. An inspiring video features President John F. Kennedy's famous We Choose to Go to the Moon speech, as well as iconic artifacts that guests encounter during their visit. Hopefully you had a chance to enjoy it a few, day, a few minutes today. And uh, John, we will not be streaming the Super Bowl as you asked uh, later on. So, we also have more additions, two new virtual re reality attractions, Hyperdeck, Mission Moon, and Blue Origin's New Shepard virtual space flight experience bring to life space travel in a realistic and fun way. Inside our Heroes and Legends, featuring US Astronaut Hall of Fame, presented by Boeing, you can find a new exhibit featuring trailblazers throughout NASA space history who have inspired millions of people. On the horizon, we're creating something marvelous at the gantry at LC-39. We'll allow the guests to learn about nature preserve around the KSC and visit brand new a brand new educational exhibit called the Earth Information Center. Today is also a special day. NASA astronauts Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams are set to launch aboard Boeing Starliner spacecraft atop a United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket at 12.25 p.m. today, and we wish them great success and Godspeed. So, uh, let's hope for that, because that's a heck of a day. A heck of a day. So thank you and congratulations to this year's inductees. And now I'd like to welcome Kurt Brown, Chair of the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation, to say a few words. Kurt, you're a man in your own. The man, the myth, the legend. <laughs> and a heck of a body man, too, from the Camaro family. Can I get on, in on that lifetime pass to the, to the thing? I mean, since we're giving out free passes to Zarella, really. But, uh, wow, what a group, a lot of people here. Thank you all for coming out. Um, thank you, Theron, again for the introduction, and thank you all for being here with this very memo uh, memo momentous occasion, if I could only talk here. As chairman of the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation and a fellow astronaut, it brings me great joy to be here among so many friends from the astronaut community, along with all our friends from the Kennedy Space Center here today to celebrate the introduction of Dave Hilmers and Marsha Ivins into the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame. In addition to establishing the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation to keep America at the forefront of technology, the Mercury 7 astronauts believe there should be a permanent place to showcase the accomplishments of America's space pioneers. 
This dream translated into reality as the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame was created in 1990 and continues to live on in the heroes and legends featuring the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame presented by Boeing here at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex. Thanks to the partnership with NASA and the Delaware North folks, as well as the support of corporations and individual supporters, the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation has reached an important milestone this year. We are celebrating our 40th anniversary. <laughs> ASF awards merit-based scholarships to the best and brightest students across the country and is known nationwide for being among the largest monetary scholarships awarded to undergraduate STEM students. This year we're so proud we are set to award or we have awarded 71 astronaut scholars and since our inception ASF has awarded more than nine million dollars in scholarships and more than 800 to more than 800 of the nation's top uh, scholars. Now here's the fun part. We're extremely proud of our scholars and their accomplishments. In fact, we have a small group of our Astronaut Scholars recipients with us here today. Scholars, this is an order now. You have to stand up. Please stand up and be recognized. the very distinct honor to welcome Dave Hilmers and Marsha Ivins into the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame. And again, thank you. And it's my honor to introduce Kim Carter, Kennedy Space Center's Director, Center of Engagement and Business Integration Services to the stage. Kim. pleasure to be here today and share this incredible work taking place at Kennedy Space Center as we honor two extraordinary people whose work has added so much to the legacy of our center and our agency. For more than six decades, Kennedy has been launching the missions that have changed how we live on our planet and what we know about our universe. And our spaceport is committed to supporting creativity and innovation for decades to come. This last year at Kennedy, we saw 72 launches from the Eastern Range. And the Spaceport's 2024 launch manifest currently supports over 100 launches, more than triple what we saw three years ago. While the history of our center is inspiring, the work ahead of us is opening the door to a universe of new discoveries. Through the Artemis, NASA will be returning humans to the moon for the first time in more than a half of a century. In the early morning hours of November the 16th, 2022, Artemis 1 lifted off this historical launch pad 39B the successful 25-day mission was the first in a series that will send humans back to the moon as humanity learns to live and work in deep space, paving the way for exploration deeper into our universe. Building on the success for Artemis 1, Artemis 2 crewed test flight is targeting September 2025 to set to test the SLS, rocket, and Orion crew capsule ahead of launching the first woman, the first person of color, and the first non-American on lunar surface, creating opportunities for more science and inspiration than ever before. In support of a sustained human presence in deep space, Gateway Deep Space Logistics is based here at Kennedy Space Center and leading the development of humanity's supply chain to the moon, including procuring services for transporting cargo, equipment, 
consumables to enable exploration to the lunar surface and beyond. Now closer to home, the International Space Station, Kennedy is supporting a number of programs that are innovating for the benefit of those on our planet. NASA's commercial crew program has led the development of the next generation of human-rated commercial spacecraft carrying astronauts to the International Space Station. NASA and our SpaceX partners recently launched the eighth operational crew rotation to the space station. And we're looking forward to the crew test flight of Boeing Starliner in just a couple of hours. Kennedy's Launch Services Program procures launch services for science and technology payloads ranging from small satellites to NASA's large missions by working with various launch providers. The program helps NASA achieve its scientific and exploration goals efficiently and cost-effectively. NASA is known for setting and accomplishing audacious goals. When President John F. Kennedy made his famous address to Congress, summoning the nation to work together to send a man to the moon and return him safely to Earth, it was the stuff of science fiction. That appeal drew a line in the sand challenging our country to look beyond what seemed impossible and to rally together to do what no one had ever done before. Today, we stand on the other side of that figurative line, knowing what is possible and pushing even further. And as we enter a new era of space exploration, Kennedy is not just launching rockets, we are launching humanity's future. Today is a historical day that we are sharing all together. Congratulations to today's inductees and thank you. Thank you, Kim. Uh, you know, where's Kirk? 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 I, if you want one of those annual passes, I know a guy. We can get it taken care of this afternoon. Thank you all. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to begin the induction of the 25th class of astronauts into the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame. The 2024 inductees were selected by a committee of current Hall of Fame astronauts former NASA officials, historians, and journalists. The process is administered by the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. To be eligible, now pay attention, an astronaut must have made his or her first flight at least 15 years before the induction. Candidates must be U.S. citizens and either a NASA-trained space shuttle commander, pilot, mission specialist, or an International Space Station commander or flight engineer who has orbited the Earth at least once and whose last day eligible for flight assignment as a NASA astronaut was at least five years prior to nomination. You got that? <laughs> I'm not going over it again. Our first inductee is David Hilmers. Mission Specialist Hilmers and Stewart. As a mission control, you can lower the state of gear and emit full cover. The progress of the count and monitoring the commitment of the vehicle. Also, the planets appear to be going at the time. Yeah, go for main engine start. T minus six. We have main engine start. Four, three, two, one. Ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of Atlantis. A new orbiter joins the shuttle fleet and it has cleared the tower.
sure does feel good to see the Challenger mission continue and America back in space. And the crew of Discovery now coming down, waving a large American flag. On the uh, runway, runway 17, here is the Dryden Flight Research Facility, Vice President George Bush. David Hillman being assisted with his helmet. Three, two, one, zero. Ignition and liftoff of Atlantis and mission STS-36. To another mission specialist, David Hillman. And liftoff, liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery and the first international microgravity laboratory. The Discovery now flying free with the recursion under the power of its own main propulsion system. Roger, Discovery, and welcome back. Your mission has given us a preview of space station operations and a look at the international cooperation that will be a part of future space exploration. Here to present David Hilmers for induction into the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame is astronaut Norm Thagard. Norm? Well, that introduction made my job easier. My original thought was this was going to be one of the most difficult things I ever did because Colonel Dr. David C. Hilmers is a pretty incredible individual. And my concern was, no matter how convincing I might try to be, those of you who don't know Dave would say, ah, you're exaggerating. The easy part is, I don't have to exaggerate because what I'm gonna tell you is pretty incredible in its own right. You heard a lot of, or saw a lot of its background from the screen, but just let me elaborate on it a little bit. He graduated from high school in 68, he was a triple sport athlete in football, track, and basketball. Did that hurt his grade point average? Probably not. He graduated as valedictorian of his high school class. In 1972, you saw he graduated from Cornell College in Iowa. He was again a triple sport athlete, this time in football, track, and wrestling. Well, did that hurt his grade point average? Probably not. When he got his Bachelor of Arts in Mathematics, he graduated summa cum laude. And as you know, that is the highest grouping for graduates. Also during that time he was an undergraduate, he was going to Marine officer training in the summers, I would imagine, at Quantico. And he was commissioned a second lieutenant when he did graduate and it is noteworthy that he was sent to flight training where he became a bombardier navigator in the A-6 attack aircraft. 
But the Marine Corps saw right away how smart he was, and they sent him to Monterey, California, to the Naval Postgraduate School, where in 1977, he received a Master of Science with distinction in electrical engineering. I guess he couldn't decide what it was he wanted to be in life. In 1978, he received a doctoral level degree, electrical engineer. Two years later, he is one of 19 members of the ninth group of NASA astronaut selectees. You saw his missions, and in 19, in fact, it was October of, of uh, 85, and I want to emphasize the October 85. He was on that DOD mission, which was STS-51J, he did a lot of important things on the mission, but if he were to tell you about any of those things, since it was a classified Department of Defense mission, he would then have to shoot you. <laughs> Why did I emphasize the fact that it was in October? Because he had an assignment for STS-61F, the, the Ulysses Centaur mission, that was supposed to launch on 15 May of 1986. There are not many astronauts who have been assigned to fly their second mission less than eight months after they fly their first mission. And that just tells you that NASA astronaut program and its officers and executives recognized his talents and his abilities. That Ulysses Centaur mission was going to send the Ulysses probe off to Jupiter where it was gonna use gravitational assist to go into polar orbit perpendicular to the planetary orbital plane around the sun where it would do science research on the north and south poles of the sun. The problem we had with the Centaur, the booster, the very powerful Centaur booster, was all those thousands of pounds of liquid hydrogen oxygen in the Centaur booster that sat in the payload bay. We were so concerned with that risk that within the astronaut office, we finally referred to the Centaur as the Death Star. <laughs> Rick Houck, his commander, was so concerned about the risk that he went to Dave and the rest of the crew and he said that if any of you guys want to get out for this flight, I'll support you. Now, I was the, the uh, MS-1 for the Galileo Centaur mission, and I have to tell you this, and this is sound astounding too, they were gonna launch on 15 May of 86, and we were gonna launch on 20 May of 86 off the other path. And because of the reputation of the Centaur, I one day went to Dave and I said, you think if you guys blow up, they'll still go ahead and launch us five days later? <laughs> that was kind of the humor you saw in Vietnam among fighter pilots. I remember one coming up to me one day and saying, if you get shot down, can I have your stereo? So we were used to that kind of stuff. Anyhow, after the Challenger accident, NASA reevaluated the risk of flying a Centaur on a sh shuttle, and they canceled the mission, postponed it, and redesigned it to be sent by a solid rocket booster. The thing of it is, because I was the MS-1 on the Galileo Centaur, and he was a mission specialist on the Ulysses, we did a lot of our training together. We weren't on the same crew, but five days apart, a lot of our training was in parallel. What I realized in that is he is one of the smartest people I have ever met. No joke. Anyhow, with the cancellation or the postponement of the Galileo, or the Ulysses Centaur mission, Dave was reassigned to STS-26, and you saw that. We call that in the office the return to flight because it was the very first shuttle flight after the Challenger accident. I think it was 29 September of 88, you folks launched this time on the, on the, would have been the Discovery, right? Yeah. And uh, they launched a Tedris III, which was a communication satellite. Then in 1990, I think it was February of 1990, he launched on STS-36, which was another DOD mission. That, this time, I guess somebody didn't keep their mouth shut, and it was actually rumored that they launched a reconnaissance satellite. The interesting thing is Dave also has the experience of being on the shuttle that ever achieved the highest orbital inclination of any shuttle flight. 
by using this unique dogleg maneuver post SRB set, they achieved a 62 degree orbital inclination. Normally the highest the shuttle could achieve was 57 degrees. Uh, again, he can't really tell you, or he would have to shoot you, so we won't go into that. <laughs> On 5 April of 1991, Dr. Sonny Carter, Navy physician and test pilot, was killed on Atlantic Southeast Airlines Flight 2311 out of Atlanta that crashed on approach to Brunswick, Georgia. Sonny was killed on that flight along, there were 23 people. Former Texas Senator John Tower was killed on that. And sad to say, one young little boy and girl were also killed. Now that created a problem for me and my commander on STS-42, the first international microgravity lab mission. And the reason it did is because the rest of us had nine, had a year and a half to train for that flight and it was a complex flight. We had 55 experiments from investigators in 11 different countries. Now we're nine months from launch. We launched on 22 January of 1996. What are we gonna do? We've gotta get somebody there who can train in that half the time the rest of us are having on this complex science flight. I thought of Dave, and as the payload commander, I recognized, I, I told Ron Gravy, our commander, that Dave is the guy we need. Now that sounds, you've got a Marine Colonel, right? And we're gonna put him in on this science flight with half the time to train. Why would you do that? Because we already knew that he could do that. Well, here's the other thing. Dave had decided after his third flight that he was gonna to go to medical school. And we went to Dave to ask him if he would succeed Sonny and fly that flight with us, and he agreed. He did point out that it might have some impediment to him taking the medical college admission test. But he stayed with us, and I will say, while he's training with half the time we had for a complex mission, he was bored, so he decided he would take night courses in organic chemistry and biology because they were medical school prerequisites. Okay, so we launch, and we get up there, and Dave with Ulf Mirbol was on one of the two 12-hour two, uh, shifts that we had because we were 24-hour ops, and with Roberta Bondar, the Canadian woman astronaut, I was on the other two-person 12-hour shift. We had 55 experiments, as I said, from 11 different countries, and we had one failure. And that was in a crystal growing experiment, and though that crystal had already formed before we ever launched. So what do I have to say that? Ron and I agreed that Dave performed exactly as we had expected him to perform perfectly. Thanks, Norm. This I've known Norm for over 40 years now. <clears throat> and I think this is the first time I'll have the last word. Uh, I'm not sure I have a lot to say after uh, Norm spoke, but thanks to each one of you uh, for coming today, friends, family, and distinguished guests. And I should say thanks to Boeing and to NASA for scheduling the launch, being kind enough to schedule the launch today, of course. But uh, what an incredible honor it is for me to be remembered and inducted into the Hall of Fame. It's, it's really humbling to read the list of astronauts who have been selected before me, all these that uh, are here today. And I'm sure that there are many former astronauts that are also here today that deserve this honor much more than I do. And it's particularly gratifying that uh, I'm so honored against the being right below Atlantis. 
I was on board Atlantis when it blasted into the sky for the very first time in a beautiful October day in 1985. Our crew had the opportunity to see her as she was being built um, at the Rockwell plant in uh, Palmdale, California. And then when she was delivered to the Kennedy Space Center in April 1985 for processing. She was gleaming like a shiny new car when, as we went out to the launch pad. It was my very first flight as well, and I was bursting with anticipation to get a space flight under my belt and become a real astronaut. This was before the Challenger accident, and you might have seen on the uh, video that instead of getting into our familiar orange pressure suits that we flew for the first time on my next flight, STS-26, we walked out of the crew quarters and got into the crew bus in our light blue flight suits. When we got out to the, uh, the pad, the Cape Crusaders, and Marsha was there, um, and she helped strap us in and get into our survival vests and get into our seats. So I was out there in the pad and I was sitting on my back for about five minutes and I turned to the astronaut next to me, Bob Stewart, said, hey, hey, Bob, this isn't really very comfortable being out here in the launch pad at all. And he agreed with me. So we actually unstrapped, did a little flip, and sat on the back of the seats until it got to the nine uh, minute hold. And finally, when we came out of the hold, our commander, uh, Bo Bobko, told us that, you know, it might be a good idea to get strapped back in. And so we, had, of course, did that. I'll have to say that that was a much more comfortable countdown and launch that I had on subsequent flights, such as STS-36, where we had a couple launch delays and were out on the pad for two and a half hours before we scrubbed the launch. So Atlantis performed like a champ on that mission. It was really a clean vehicle and had very few anomalies during the whole flight. So any problems that we had were really attributed to my own rookie mistakes, like flailing around the cabin, figuring out how to eat, sleep, and go to the bathroom without making a mess or bothering others on the crew. Atlantis also performed admirably on my third mission in space, STS-36. As Norm mentioned, we were able to get up to a very high inclination of 62.1 degrees, which took us right up the East Coast on launch. The low altitude and the high inclination gave us unmatched viewing opportun opportunities of the Earth. I believe on one of Marsh's missions, she had a very low altitude as well, making for great photo ops, and knowing Marsha, she took great advantage of that. Throughout it all, Atlantis never let me down, and it's amazing to be standing below her on this occasion. Although she's retired, she continues to be on duty, giving many thousands of visitors the opportunity to see what it was like to be on board. Like Atlantis, I too retired from active duty with NASA and started a new mission. My path took me down an entirely different direction. And this is actually the first time I've returned to the Kennedy Space Center for over three decades. But memories of those years at NASA, the accomplishments of the space shuttle program, the relationships that were made, the teamwork, and indeed those who gave their lives to achieve the dream of going into space are never far from my mind. I was so fortunate to be able to carry the baton during my time as an astronaut. And it was clear to me when it was time to pass it along to the next generation. I am so humbled that you have remembered me after all these years and that you feel that my contributions are somehow worthy of recognition. It is our job, yours and mine, to make sure that the dream of space exploration never dies that there is always a new generation, our astronaut scholars, to whom to pass the torch. 
a generation with the necessary skills, determination, and education to carry out our mission. I thank each one of you, not only for the honor that you've bestowed on me today, but also for the support that ensures that the dream of space exploration will always stay alive. Thank you very much, and go Starline. our second candidate for induction into the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame, Marsha Ivins. booster ignition and lift God at Columbia. A new decade of spaceflight begins. The uh, Columbia uh, virtually will pass over the uh, coast of the southern tip of the African continent. Marsha Ivins, the flight engineer, and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Atlantis on a mission for new utility in space. Marsha Ivins, primary person for photo and television documentation of the Eureka and TSS operations. We have created this uh, wiring nightmare here that allows me to record on pre-recorder the basic limiter, or it's recorded which we're only using if we need resources. I record from one monitor onto the camcorder and I record onto this little kiosk. The car is working really well. Marsha Ivins sees herself on NASA Select TV. And liftoff, liftoff of the Space Shuttle Columbia as NASA continues on the cutting edge of microgravity research. She's making her fourth flight into space. Our flight engineer will be operating the robotic arm. Two, one, zero, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis with Destin. TBAs, two astronauts outside. She'll be attaching the U.S. Laboratory Destiny to the space station using that robotic arm. It's a big lab and it's a small bay and there wasn't much room in there, but coming out in the Navy, the arms performed flawlessly.
please welcome Marsha Ivins. <laughs> To present Marsha Ivins for induction in the Hall of Fame, astronaut John Runsfeld. John? Well, thanks all for coming here. And I will try and keep it brief because I'm keeping you all between this and lunch. Today is our opportunity to celebrate the human element of spaceflight. You know, we have the wonderful Atlantis that Marsh and I flew on uh, above us, um, but in the end, it's a human spaceflight experience. Even the science flights that we fly, after all, are still about people. Uh, you know, I often have said that, you know, we have wonderful rovers on Mars, and they haven't discovered anything. Scientists on Earth discover things using those rovers. And our spaceflight program really is about uh, humans going beyond uh, the surface of the Earth and our future. I'm really thrilled and honored to introduce to you Marsha Ivins, our new Astronaut Hall of Fame member, and congratulations to David, um, and my favorite Martian. Now, many of you think this is about uh, Marsha and David, but actually, uh, it's all about Kurt uh, in the end. I, I just want to give Kurt a thanks for being uh, the chairman of the board of the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation and all the work that he does tirelessly to help our great astronaut scholars. Some of you may know that Kurt was my commander on STS-103, so I have to suck up to him. <laughs> Marsha Ivins is a maggot. And that's the class name of the 10th group of astronauts selected in 1984. You'll have to ask her how that uh, happened. She, as you know, she flew in five space shuttle missions. She's a native of Pennsylvania, graduated from the University of Colorado. I live in Boulder now in aerospace engineering. And if you think back to the uh, late 1970s, uh, or 1970s, very few women went into aerospace engineering. So that was a pretty adventurous thing for Marsha to do, but already you must know that she's a very adventurous person. At NASA, she began her career uh, as an engineer in, in the human factors field, which at that time was called man machine engineering. Uh, and so all of us who flew on the space shuttle owe her a debt of gratitude for work that she did in helping to arrange and engineer the, the controls and displays and the heads-up display on the space shuttle, uh, which gives the commander guidance, uh, pilot and commander guidance on, on entry. And from that uh, launch pad, she then became a NASA pilot. Uh, and she is, was already a very experienced pilot, uh, flying you know, a number of airplanes. She has an uh, uh, airplane, flight instructor, glider ratings. And I, you know, talking to her a little while ago, she used to tote banners as well. I won't tell you, you know, what was on the banners or how, how you would pick up those banners. It's too scary, um, you know, much scarier than riding on a space shuttle. But a very accomplished pilot, thousands of hours. And she was also uh, typewriter and a pilot in the NASA Gulfstream 1 aircraft, um, which is one of my favorites. It's a twin turboprop aircraft. And with that uh, rating, she shares uh, with Werner Von Braun, who I'm told loved to fly that aircraft. Marsha is not an attention seeker. Uh, in fact, when I, uh, Kurt called her to announce that she was selected into the Astronaut Hall of Fame, uh, I think she had some reticence about this whole event and being in front of the camera because she much prefers to be behind the camera. And she is an incredibly expert and talented photographer, something that uh, I really appreciated when I flew with her on STS-81, learned a great deal from her. And virtually all, I think all of the photos that you see from astronauts, you know, some part of those photos uh, come from Marsha's expertise 
helping NASA select cameras, lenses, film. If anybody wants to know what film is, I can explain that later. <laughs> uh, but, you know, she shepherded that photography program, you know, all through the entire space shuttle and, and most of the International Space Station program, and we owe her a debt of gratitude for that. On orbit, she helped to make IMAX films. Uh, I was lucky enough to make an IMAX film uh, with Scott Altman and others on Hubble, called Hubble 3D. She made a film called, uh, most recent film called uh, ISS 3D, and we worked with a wonderful, wonderful uh, producer director named Tony Myers, uh, who's a dear friend of both of ours. She passed away, sadly, uh, recently. Um, but Marsha was pivotal in many of the IMAX films that you may see about the space shuttle program, and to that we all owe her a debt of gratitude. I flew with Marsha on STS-81 on Atlantis, up to the Mir space station. Uh, she was in charge of all the logistics, the thousands of pounds of food, water, supplies, tools, experiments that went up to the Mir. And she leveraged her role uh, that she helped, I think, everybody here in the logistics of stowage on the space shuttle, one of her roles. Uh, and at every bench review, I would see Marsha. Bench reviews where you get to see all of the things that are going into the shuttle. It's in Houston, uh, so that you can play with them and you know check out pit pins and look for sharp edges and things. Uh, and for my flights, Marsha was always there, even when we weren't flying together. And we all owe her a debt of gratitude. Uh, she also helped, as you heard, strap David Hilmers in. She was a Cape Crusader, the astronaut support personnel that is at the Cape to support us prior to launch and straps us in. They're the last ones uh, that we see. And, uh, you know, she just was phenomenal and knew the shuttle inside and out. And for that, we also owe her a debt of gratitude. Of all her talents, though, uh, I think the one that nearly all astronauts appreciate the most is that she is the uh, chief executive office chairman, chief cook, and only person in the Ivan's Bakery. <laughs> she is, is famous to astronauts and astronaut families for her wonderful cookies and cakes. Uh, you know, I have incredibly fond memories and a little bit of weight from cookies uh, that we ate in quarantine prior to launch and our families would get cakes on the way back uh, on the aircraft from launch. And uh, Butch and Butch Wilmer and Sonny Williams going to orbit today almost certainly have a little bit of Ivan's Bakery in their gut today. <laughs> Marsha flew her fifth flight uh, to the ISS operating the Canada arm to install the U.S. Uh, laboratory on the space station, you know, which looked like it would be incredibly difficult and she made it look easy as she has done with all of her efforts in space. Um, afterwards, she became the first chief of the first exploration branch in the astronaut office. And this is at a time where NASA leadership wasn't really talking about going beyond the International Space Station. And she knew, she had a vision, that we would be going beyond the International Space Station to the moon and eventually to Mars. Uh, and that's now called the Artemis program. So she really is one of the, the founders of our Moon to Mars program. Uh, it was a small group that included myself and Scott Horwitz and Mark Kelly. Uh, and I really enjoyed working with her in that. Uh, I would say that uh, we were a bit controversial. And, you know, Marsha, not wanting to be in the, in the limelight, uh, still helped push NASA forward, you know, without uh, revealing, you know, all of our qualities in a way that, that was problematic. But of all the qualities uh, about Marsha Ivins, um, Perhaps the one that I appreciate the most and have appreciated the most over the years uh, is that she has a very precise and extremely accurate uh, BS meter. <laughs> and if anybody in the audience needs me to explain the BS acronym, uh, ask somebody else. <laughs> um, but Marsha is a dear colleague, a dear, dear friend, my favorite Martian, and now Hall of Fame astronaut. Marsha. Thank you.
John. Um, I'm glad both John and Dave took a moment to acknowledge Atlantis here. If you haven't, please look up and acknowledge this piece of, of human history that you are sitting under today. Um, my most uncomfortable place, of course, is the center of anyone's attention. Um, as John said, I'm way more comfortable behind the lens than in front of it, and, but I am flattered and humbled by, by the amazingly kind um, and in some cases accurate words. <laughs> and because we have a way more important moment in human history sitting on the launch pad right now, um, my remarks will be very brief. Um, there are a lot of people I can thank and would like to not acknowledge and remember. Um, I'd like to thank the Astronaut Scholarship Fund and the Hall of Fame members for actually awarding me this honor here. I'd like to thank John Grunsfeld um, uh, for getting me on the stage in the first place. Um, your friendship is a gift, I mean, in a good way. Um, to Dave Hilmers, it is a, a privilege um, really to share a stage with someone I consider one of the finest human beings on or off the planet. Um, I'd like to, to remember Roger Zwig and Charlie Hayes, the first two of the wolves who raised me. Uh, George Abbey for hiring me and for his undying passion and for and defense of human spaceflight. To John Young for being forever and always John Young. To my maggot class um, for giving us a very unique identity and for Shep, if he's here, um, for giving us the name. To Dan Brandenstein for taking me on my first spaceflight and to Lauren Shriver for taking me on my second one anyway. <laughs> to Ellen Baker for being my person, always. Uh, to Sonny and Butch sitting on the launch pad now demonstrating why we are all in this room in the first place. And especially to the workforce at the Kennedy Space Center, the most hardworking and inspirational workforce on the planet. Their work ethic gave us the, their touch labor. Work ethic gave us the confidence, everybody sitting in the front row here, to actually get on the rocket. And to the friends that we have lost to human spaceflight and to life. When I was young and optimistic in the life that I would lead and the person I would become stretched out in front of me and I watched us go from zero to 25,000 in eight years, I was worried that we would step from the moon to Mars and beyond that before I ever had the chance to participate in this, this adventure in space in any way. Now, 60 some years later, I'm saddened by the thought that I may not actually live long enough to see anybody walk on Mars or go beyond. It has been an honor to have had the opportunity to participate in human spaceflight, and to my fellow dinosaurs in the room, it has been a privilege to have done it with you. States Astronaut Hall of Fame, David Hilmers and Marsha Ivan. 